It gives me great pleasure to welcome everyone to the University in Esports Conference 2020, hosted by Women in Games. Women in Games has been actively developing ways to support the esports community. In May this year, we formed a partnership with the wonderful Cat Collective, a female and LGBTQ friendly community focused on creating a safe, open-minded and engaging environment to play games. In September, alongside our Women in Games Global Conference, we supported the Cat Collective Community Cup, our first esports event for women and non-binary Overwatch players from established community groups. We worked with the established and professional tournament organizers, Monkey Bubble, this tournament had a format and additional rules to encourage a professional but fun community experience for all teams and was conceived to encourage more casual players to join and participate in community competitive gaming. We have also launched our Women in Games eSports Discord to build a positive and vibrant community. We currently have nearly 400 members and it's growing fast. I'd like to encourage you all to join this Discord server to network with speakers and each other after the event finishes. We will add the link to the chat and I'll remind you again at the end of the conference. Women in Games has an ambassador program ecosystem consisting of individual ambassadors, corporate ambassadors and educational ambassadors all with a passion to engage with supporting our vision of a games industry, culture and community free of gender discrimination, where full equity of opportunity, treatment and conditions empowers all girls and women from all backgrounds to achieve their full potential. This week, we have announced 46 new individual ambassadors, taking our members to over 400 globally in 47 different countries. We have 14 corporate ambassadors, such as 2K, Rockstar, Sumo Group, TT Games, Sledgehammer, just to name a few. And we recently launched our Educational Ambassadors Programme. I'm proud to say tonight that the first to join amongst UK universities was the University of Roehampton, demonstrating its commitment to diversity in gaming on campus along with Norwich University of the Arts, Winchester School of Art and Abate University. If your university is interested in learning more about this programme, please do get in touch with us. Please let us know who you are and where you are from in the chat. Our chat moderator and manager is Charlie Harbord. Charlie was our amazing applied game designer in residence for our recent Women in Games Global Conference. So we are delighted she is joining us this evening. I know she will be encouraging you to ask questions throughout the conference in the chat, so please don't be shy. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Jonas Conatatus from the University of Roehampton, who will talk about scholarships and diversity in esports. I can see Jonas is there, so uh, it's over to you now, Jonas. <laughs> Uh, Roehampton uh, Scholarship and Diversity in Esports uh, talk program and everything like that. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer any and all of your questions. Uh, I've tried doing this presentation. Uh, I did the test run because I know I have only 15 minutes. I did this talk uh, once with these slides. I spoke for eight minutes. La next time I did 25 minutes. So I don't know where exactly I'm going to land, but I promise not to talk longer than for 15 minutes. So let's begin. Rohampton Esports is, uh, program started in 2018, what seems like ages ago right now, to be honest. On the left, you can see the very first iteration of the uh, esports arena, uh, which we're incredibly proud of. As you can see, it's, it's, it's very bare bones. Uh, it was very bare, bare bones in September 2018 when we launched it. The, uh, there were essentially no decorations. The room itself was a music classroom, and the saving grace of that room was that it had... Um, sound isolating walls, which the lecturers uh, and office uh, users around us were really, really appreciated of. 
Um, but you can see it's it's very bare bones. You have the basic 60 hertz monitors, the traditional HP keyboards and things like that. So, And this picture was taken actually at the very first event that we hosted uh, as esports program. And it was the League of Legends World Championship final viewing. I think it was at like 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. or something like that. And there's one student who showed up. But uh, I, I was still happy to have that student there. And uh, it was it was a great start, great origin story for us. It, it was a slow start, but uh, we've, we've achieved a lot in the last two years. And on the right, you can see Julia. Uh, Julia Chiresh uh, was the um, first person in UK to receive an esports scholarship. Julia was an amazing ambassador for a Hampton esports program. And I can't thank, thank her enough for all the amazing things that she has done for us over the years. So she joined the esports scholarship program in 2018 before the official launch of the esports scholarships because the first uh, year of scholars joined us in 2019. There were nine, nine of them in total. Uh, but Julia helped us do the fund, foundation part of everything. So uh, forever grateful uh, to Julia and for everything that she has done for us. So the Hampton Esports Arena, because I'm going to talk very quickly about the esports arena itself because it's such an important and vital thing in uh, what we do. So 20 gaming PCs, uh, we just established a content creation room. Actually, this, this morning, my whole morning was spent trying to set up uh, for Fall Guys LAN tournaments. Yeah, we had 12 players playing Fall Guys. We have commentators. We have webcams. It was as, as good of a stream as we managed to produce uh, so far, and we're very excited to, to do that. Would I ever do, again, a Fall Guys tournament? Probably not. It's it's rather complicated system, and... Uh, it's probably not the most esportsy title, but it was to get more students on campus, more students playing esports, and to help with our inclusivity and diversity. This year, we also have, uh, for the second year uh, running, we have uh, partnered with Zawi, and I'll talk about all of our partners later on. Our constant goal, goal is to keep on expanding and keep doing bi bi bigger things, better things to, to improve in whatever we can. So, for example, with the esports arena in on the right, you can see the image from the current iteration. So everything has been repainted, new floors, uh, new tables, uh, better peripherals. Uh, all of it is now powered by uh, Zawi. Um, and we actually expanded the space uh, in 2019 to include two rooms. So we have 20 uh, proper gaming stations. Now this year in 2020, we actually expanded even further to obviously allow for all of the social distancing rules. So instead of having just one room in 2018. Now we have four rooms and we're slowly but surely occupying the rest of the building. So we have a few other uh, rooms that we were, were eyeing. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to expand in, into those sometime soon. Uh, a very important thing for us is developing student skills and transferable skills is probably the keyword in, in anything and everything we do because we want people to come in and play games, uh, play esports and use the facilities that we have and the esports program that we have. But we wanna make sure that those things lead into uh, transferable skills. So learning you know, how to present in front of the camera, how to uh, work with a team, how to do research, how to prepare against your opponents and things like that. And the really big focus for this year was supposed to be, we were supposed to be uh, the hub for UK university uh, scene for their land events. So we wanted Rohampton Esports to be the place where students can go and host different land events, different tournaments and things like that, which you know, hasn't really worked out, but uh, there's not much much we can do uh, about that specifically. So in regards to the scholarships, I'll quickly talk about the free photos and then I'll go into the main talking point that I wanted to talk about today. So on the left, you can see the article uh, from the Times uh, about Julia and her achievements, which was amazing. When we launched the first Rohampton Esports Scholarship, we got obviously a lot of attention. Not all of it was great, not all of it was amazing, but uh, it, it was grand majority of it, let's put it way, was uh, was very positive. In the middle picture, you can see Lily, who is the very first person to receive the Rohampton Woman in Esports uh, Scholarship. So Lily has been with us uh, for second year now. She was League of Legends player. Now she's a Valorant player. She's an amazing Valorant player. And I'm pretty sure she attended absolutely every single event that we hosted last year, which was amazing. And on the right, you can see the Rohampton Origins team, the highest ranking Rohampton team this year. And if anyone from the Newell is watching, you can, you can, you know, start uh, reserving spaces for uh, finals for us because we're 100% going to be there. So um, going back, sorry, to the scholarships themselves. So last year when we started the scholarship program in 2019, we had um, nine scholars join the scholarship. This year we have over 20 and we're planning to expand next year as well. So the... Uh, the list of students is growing and the quality of applicants is growing as well. And we're very, very excited about that. 
Um, so we had the last year and this year we had the traditional Roehampton Esports uh, scholarship. This year in August, we introduced a dedicated Roehampton Women in Esports scholarship. Um, so to talk about that, why the dedicated scholarship? Why did we need a scholarship like that? Well, there's uh, a few things. We, we spoke to a lot of people in the industry. We spoke to women in games. We spoke to Newell and a variety of uh, other partners. And we realized that something like that could be really, really beneficial uh, for the esports industry, for the university scene, and just in general, a really positive thing. When looking at what uh, Roehampton has, so at least a few years ago, uh, Roehampton... Um, had 70% of all students in Roehampton uh, were women. And when you look at specifically the Roehampton Esports Society that uh, our students are running, and it was a big part of the scholarship program, probably 20 to 30% of scholars were, um, sorry, 20, 20 to 30% of members were women. When we looked at who is applying for the scholarships, we realized that 99% of all the applications are uh, from men. And one thing that we wanted to make sure with the Roehampton Women in Esports Scholarship is to open up and make sure that these opportunities, scholarship opportunities and training opportunities and all of these kind of things are used by uh, a much more wider and much more diverse uh, community that we have here on campus. So how is the Roehampton Women in Esports Scholarship different? There's two main things that differ. So thing number one is that it includes a, a mentorship scheme. So we haven't done it with the traditional scholarship scheme yet, but hopefully sometime in the future. But with the Roehampton Women in Esports uh, uh, Scholarship, we're trying to create a really strong and competent uh, mentorship scheme. So we're trying and asking all of our partners to nominate at least one or even more members of their staff to uh, help and guide our scholars uh, through the whole process of you know being in university, how to get a job in in the esports industry, how to find, uh, how to do networking, how to find teams if you're into competitive side. So that's the main uh, the difference, number one. The second difference is that we're expanding not just the women in esports scholarship, but the other scholarships as well. So it's not just about the players anymore. Last year, when we were looking at the scholarship applicants, the absolute main thing for us was, what is your rank? So you pretty much had to be the top 1% in all of the games. So, you know, in, in CSGO, it was sort of global elite. In League of Legends, it was Diamond 4 and above, at least at the very latest, at the very lowest. Um, but with these new scholarships, we are expanding it into shoutcasters, uh, tournament organizers, hosts, um, social media managers, and things like that. So we're trying, we're not trying to raise the next generation of League of Legends, sorry, not trying to raise the next generation of esports players, but we're now looking at and trying to uh, raise the new generation of esports professionals in general. So who can apply for the scholarship? Absolutely anyone can apply uh, for the scholarship. With, together with the two scholarships that we offer, you no longer need to be just absolutely amazing player, uh, you know, to be in the top 1%. We're opening it up to a much, much wider um, audience. So what's next if, if the women in esports scholarship? So at the moment we have two scholars confirmed. So obviously we're trying and hoping to expand it to more scholars in January when a lot more students hopefully will be joining Roehampton University. Uh, but also from January, we'll be launching a dedicated uh, program with local schools and colleges and trying to get uh, women players in those schools and colleges to get in their interest in esports and help them develop their skills and uh, through esports and you know, whatever exactly that means. And the program will try to have a monthly sessions with them um, and we will we'll be uh, doing a variety of events. Hopefully, we'll be able to host events on campus. Uh, but if not, we'll try to invite a lot of speakers, guest speakers, lecturers. Uh, so if anyone watching here is interested in, in getting involved, we would highly appreciate that. So the things we've learned over the years, um, strong and diverse, diverse committee is vital. Uh, when we started in 2019, the Esports Society, when it started, it was just a group of students who essentially just got the signatures just to start the scholarship. This year, we have a very, very strong uh, committee, which I'm very excited about. And we also expanded the, the rest of the roles for, uh, for our committee. So for the Esports Society, now including things like uh, inclusivity admin, so a person who will whose uh, role will specifically be to uh, keep us accountable uh, on inclusivity and other things that we do. Uh, in Roehampton. So student-led projects have also been very important to us So because we know that um, if we give students ownership 
of their own projects, they will be a lot more engaged and a lot more interested in, in, in the things we're doing. A great example of that is going to be a project that we're launching soon. Uh, our scholar for Rainbow Six, Bradley, he's going to launch a, well, he's looking to launch the uh, University All-Stars project, which I'm sure you'll hear about it, uh, sometime soon. One very important thing, sort of mantra for us was that we can't grow if others grow, don't grow too. So we try to share all of our knowledge, absolutely everything we've learned over the last couple of years uh, with the rest of um, London and UK esports society. So we had chats with University of West London, Warwick, uh, and a variety of other universities, South Bank, um, about what we do, how we do, and how we can help them grow. Because we know if, as I mentioned, like if we don't grow, then the other societies can't really grow as well. And of course, the word of the year is transferable skills. Whenever speaking to any lecturers or anyone else on campus, they are very keen on uh, making sure that uh, we use the esports to help students learn those transferable skills and uh, to get better at uh, is it content production, being in front of the camera, writing art articles, doing podcasts, and you know a whole host of things that uh, esports can offer. So going from 2018 all the way to 2020. So uh, student focus is obviously the main thing for us because we want to make sure to engage as many students as we can on campus. Uh, it's the esports arena has been instrumental in improving the student experience for off-campus students and students who were not able to afford, you know, the equipment to to play for um, to play esports at a high level. Because, like, for example, all of the monitors in the esports arena are 240 hertz, and you know, not every student will have the ability to to do that. Um, we actually had a, it's, it's sort of a very good problem to have, but when we wanted to send our Overwatch team for the new uh, summer tournament, we realized that we can't do that because a majority of our players don't have good enough setup at home and they were using Esports Arena as the main place to uh, play in those tournaments. So it's, you know, another win for the uh, having an arena like that on campus. Um, Student opportunities, we're trying to work with a variety of different partners, which I'm going to uh, mention in a second, on uh, getting our students, uh, well, out in the field and out on the virtual online field uh, at the moment. Um, yeah, so uh, change of focus, as I mentioned, we're no longer focusing just specifically on the players, we're focusing more on the professionals um, of the industry. So trying to raise the next generation of those professionals. Uh, and we're trying to become you know, an example in all of the fields, things like when it comes to uh, mental health, student performance, uh, student support, and a variety of other things. We want to make sure that we are at the top and we are doing things that other societies and universities can uh, learn from. And you know, bringing new partners on board is incredibly important for us. So these are the main partners that we have for uh, for this year. And there's a, a host of of other smaller partners that uh, I'm not able to to cover during this talk because um, we know that we will not be able to. We don't have the expertise to cover all of the things. So for example, Women in Games and Cat Collective are going to be helping us with the. Uh, inclusivity and diversity aspect of uh, of everything we do on campus because we know we we know the areas where we can improve but there's so much more that we just simply don't have the knowledge. Zowie is our main hardware uh, partner in making sure that the students have top top of the line equipment that um, they can use and you know not be limited by the equipment they have. G Science is going to be helping us with the student uh, health and mental well-being. Newell and London Esports are sort of our main competitive partners uh, on the competitive side for students who want to reach the next level. And of course, the university esports department and the whole university has also made the uh, raise the game pledge for uh, diversity. So there's a variety of things that we're doing. And if anyone else sort of wants to be involved with us and um, be a part of what we're building here at University of Rockhampton, we would be very, very happy to to have you on board. And I believe that's it. Uh, my timer shows 14 minutes and 50 seconds. So I think I've done very, very well. Um, but thanks so much for everyone who, who was listening. Uh, who, uh, If you have any questions, hopefully I'll be able to answer uh, some of them later. If not, you can always email us at esports at rohampton.ac.uk. Hello, David. I will be leaving now and best of luck. Hi, Jonas. Um, thanks very much. Good. Uh... Evening, everyone from the UK, uh, and good morning to those of us um, that are watching from the USA. And I know there is a few. So, uh, just to give you a, a little bit more background um, on this conference, so we started looking at this uh, conference back in probably January, February, um, 
uh, and we were planning a live physical event um, in July with um, Jonas and the University of Roehampton. So obviously that all went to uh, to pot. So I'm, I'm very happy that this has all come together today. And the reality is that because you are remote, more people uh, will be able to see it than we could possibly physically get down to uh, uh, the University of Roehampton for a half day conference, which is what we are planning. You know, maybe next year, um, uh, you know, we may look at a physical conference, but this is uh, um, uh, uh, all looking good for today as a great agenda. Uh, everyone in the chat, you know, we want to know which universities are, 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 are watching. Definitely say, hi, I'm from uh, XYZ University. We want to know um, who's in our audience. Uh, and also, I know there should be uh, a whole host of uh, university um, academics and staff um, watching this as well as um, uh, students. Uh, and one of the, our objectives of, of, uh, of Women in Games, and I hope for all esports societies, is to try and get um, the universities to support uh, your club and society as much as possible. So. Um, if you have questions for Jonas, <laughs> please put them in the chat. Jonas will be rejoining us with me and with our next speaker uh, in a panel that starts at 6.30, so I can ask the questions there. What um, Jonas didn't talk about, for example, was the origins of the um, uh, eSports scholarships, which are exactly the same financially as the scholarships that Roehampton gives to the traditional sports scholarships. So it's it's born out of traditional sports scholarships. If you are at a university that is offering traditional sports scholarships, um, you know, so much per person, per term, per, per year um, to sports men and women, there is no reason why you shouldn't be talking to your university and saying, hey, how about some esports scholarships? Let's get some esports talent into the university so that they can come and support our particular club so questions for jonas we can discuss them later let's move on to our next speaker um the university of warwick has a very well known um esports society it's one of the biggest and i think in terms of um uh, the competitions that they've won um they are very successful um so imagine my delight when planning this conference that I came across uh, someone that had just been appointed as an equal opportunities officer. So um, if we can get um, Harry Smith uh, to join us on stage now, that would be amazing. Hello. Hi, Harry. Right. Um, is everything good audio and visual wise? Yeah, it's all looking good. Good from, stuff from me. So please tell us all about um, Warwick Esports and your new role. And then uh, myself and Jonas and Mercy will join uh, join you again for the panel at um, uh, uh, at about six thirty. Of course. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, I've got six minutes, so I'll try my best to fit everything in. So. Hi there, I am Harry Smith and I am the Equal Opportunities Officer for Warwick Esports Society here at the University of Warwick. So before I start what I'm saying, I'm just going to start right now and say what's going to be reiterated a lot tonight, which is that esports and especially university esports is such an important sector to invest and support right now. Just at Warwick alone, we've had over 200 new members in our Discord in the last two weeks, uh, many of whom are freshers and many of whom again are women. Um, so especially in current world events, there's never been a better time for esports to get bigger. And it's, it's so fantastic to see like what's going on now and just everything that everyone's trying to do. So before I go into what uh, I do and what we do as a society uh, regarding equal opportunities, I just want to uh, give a little bit of context as uh, my experience with the society and how I got to where I am. So uh, last year I came into Warwick as a fresher. Uh, I'm a second year now. And I really, uh, when I when I first started, I really hit it off with everyone I lived with. So I didn't actually look for any societies, but I was really into my esports and my gaming prior. So after a couple of weeks, I looked if there was an esports society, saw that Warwick had one, and signed up straight away. I joined one of their League of Legends teams quite early on, 
and uh, I was playing in one of those for the first couple of terms. I even joined one of their academy teams for League of Legends since Grey Warwick uh, League of Legends teams is, is well renowned as Newell winning, NSC winning, God knows what. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, over the lockdown period, uh, I, I became more and more invested in the society and uh, I attended all their events or all the practice I could and essentially anything I could get my hands on. So uh, when at the end of the summer, they uh, cropped up with these new summer elections and said, oh, we are we are now hosting uh, elections for uh, equal opportunities officer and also for a tech sec, a technician officer. So when I heard about equal opportunities, I thought, oh, that's fantastic. This is my way of giving back to the society. And not only that, it's something I'm passionate about. So interestingly, as far as I'm aware, here at Warwick University, um, all official societies have to have some kind of equal opportunities or welfare officer within their society. Um, most of them don't actually have it as a dedicated person. It will usually be a sub role uh, for a president or a community exec, uh, just taking on all the responsibilities um, that a welfare officer would. And us as a society decided to go under a bit of a rebrand this summer, um, which is why we've decided that we're going to have equal opportunities as its own person. So originally, uh, we've uh, branded ourselves. Uh, we claimed to be the number one uh, best esports university in the UK, which wasn't wrong. We have won best esports university of the year twice in a row from NSE, uh, the National Student Esports Association. But over the summer, uh, we decided we, were, we wanted to show we were more than competitive teams. We have such a large community and we have such a love for casual games and ha having a, an active player base that everyone can just feel included and just have fun. So um, when I heard that, uh, well, when I reached out to Women in Games and I spoke to David specifically to hear that, that this conference was going on and to hear that he was uh, drafting up uh, guidelines on uh, uh, how universities uh, should um, uh, like be running their diversity and inclusion. I thought that was such a fantastic step in the right direction uh, to show how societies can just be better in terms of equality and be more diverse places in general. So with a little bit of time I've got left, I'm going to talk about things that I've done and things, so things that I've done as an equal opportunities officer and things we've done as a society to try and push even more in the right direction. So. One of the first things I did was I uh, wrote a code of conduct. I know uh, David's probably going to be thinking I'm copying what he said, but I promise I did do this before I read um, what you sent me. Um, it was, so I made a blanket set of rules and guidelines uh, and plastered them all over our discords because uh, that's our main uh, platform of communication and interaction with everyone mm -hmm. in the society. We also put it on our website, which we recently revamped, along with blogs and other resources that you could go and check out. I think it's just warwickesports.com. Uh, another, another issue that is frequently brought up is that freshers, when they join the society, uh, uh, we, we frequently get told, especially uh, from many women as well, oh, like, I would love to participate in events, but I don't have a good PC. I came to uh, university and I brought a laptop, but it can't run the game I play. So we're currently making plans to with the university uh, or making a plan to offer the university uh, to try and get some kind of on-site area for PCs, much like uh, Jonas spoke about at Roehampton. And within our community itself, we put such a massive focus on um, community nights about uh, like co constantly we're having in-house in 5v5s, we're having uh, quizzes, uh, just, just any like social nights, uh, any watch parties, anything that lets everyone have a laugh, make friends, uh, be active, and uh, most importantly, just be, be included. It, the ideology that everyone, everyone and anyone is welcome. And it keeps everyone healthy mentally as well, especially in current times. Um, I know uh, one current example, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Among Us craze at the moment, and we have full games of that almost every night in our Discord. It's so fantastic to see. Um, uh, one final thing that I want to mention is that we collaborate a lot with sister societies. We, um, one recent example of that is we collaborated with Nintendo Society to have a Super Smash Bros. tournament. Um, and also over the summer, uh, we held a online esports varsity 
with the Harriet Watt University, who is the largest esports university in Scotland. And that was such a massive success. We had uh, hundreds of players across like 10 different games. We had uh, hundreds and hundreds of viewers. It was uh, such a big success and so popular and just such a great experience for everyone. So I'm going to try and round up now so that everyone can get in for the Q&A. But I, I think it's just important that overall, you just want to make people feel included. You want to uh, anyone watching this, you, you, we are the people that need to make an effort to make the societies a place for yeah. everyone. And with all, uh, so many freshers this year, especially women um, who are so passionate about games, we just need to make the place that they can feel like is home. And we need to do all that we can to provide that. So yeah, there you go. I'm done. Uh, that, that's my spiel over. You can come back now. Uh, uh, thanks, Harry. <laughs> that was um, uh, excellent. Now, don't go uh, anywhere. Because... Don't worry, I'm not going. <laughs> We're now going to be joined back by uh, Jonas and Mercy, if we can magic. Hi, Mercy. Hi, Jonas. Hello. Um, so you've seen Jonas, you've seen Harry, you've heard from me, but you've not heard from Mercy. Mercy, maybe you could start and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, hello, everybody who's watching. Uh, my name is Mercy, and I am the president of Royal Holloway's Gaming Society as a whole. Uh, and as part of that, I'm in charge of all our esports operations at the university too. Fantastic. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the first um, of two panels that we're putting on um, now. And um, one or two people have already mentioned that women in games have been working on some... Um, uh, guidelines or, or recommendations on um, uh, diversity within uh, university esports clubs and societies. Um, uh, as you can imagine, um, this was almost starting with a blank sheet of paper. Um, uh, there is some great work from an organization in the US called AnyKey. So I'm going to give them credit now that we uh, looked at um, I think a 20 page document from 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 the US um, as a starting point. But um, uh, we sat down with um, as women in games with uh, some friends from the new uh, in a big meeting and 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 looked at um, trying to fashion something that would be genuinely uh, useful for um, student clubs and society. So not something that um, is full of theory, um, but something that is uh, uh, is practical and relevant to uh, UK universities. And indirectly, as we're hoping, uh, there are people here that are not just um, you know watching from the UK. There, there will be parallels um, uh, uh, with uh, other universities all over the world. Uh, we're just not quite sure how parallel they are, um, but uh, we're. Uh, oh, very open to you know develop these guidelines that are uh, I think at um, version 3.1 uh, at the moment and the reality is you know I'm really looking forward to this second panel this evening after us because there will be some great examples uh, coming from the next panel that hopefully we can work into uh, these guidelines before we publish them uh, and what we have said as part of this um, uh, conference is that everyone who has registered for this uh, conference, we will send you a copy of the um, uh, diversity clubs and um, uh, diversity guidelines. You know, there there are there are four pages of uh, paragraphs here uh, that I've got in front of me now, which I will crib from. Um, but uh, I thought, uh, as far as talking very generally about these guidelines, I'm going to ask. Some questions of, of um, the panelists that we have here uh, and we'll see how much uh, how many of these questions we get through but also I'm going to try and take um, some uh, some questions uh, from the chat so we will integrate those um, uh, shortly but let me kick off with the first question open to anyone to start um, uh, if you had to start reviewing uh, diversity in a club or society from scratch. Um, how would you start approaching this? So a very basic one for people that haven't done this in the past. Anyone? 
I shall, I shall go first. I think a important first step, at least, is admitting shortcomings. So times where you may have overlooked uh, how you may have shut people out from events or where um, maybe maybe you have held the skill cap too high or you just di didn't, didn't think of everyone to, uh, intentionally or otherwise. And I think having that level of humility and self-awareness is crucial in uh, identifying uh, what's wrong and what you can improve. So as well as that, uh, I think hearing what the society itself thinks is really important. Uh, sending around maybe an online feedback uh, form. Uh, uh, we recently uh, put, uh, put around uh, a big feedback form, basically asking people uh, what they like, what we were doing right, what we were doing wrong, what we could improve, and especially towards uh, community interaction and inclusion. And it was really helpful towards uh, putting ourselves in, the, in a better in a better direction, which I thought was really helpful. Great, mercy. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, I agree with everything that was said there. Um, but also if I were doing a, a wider review, um, I think getting in touch with the Students' Union as well um, and making those uh, connections, making sure that you're taking the right steps uh, when pointing out that there may be issues of inclusion or diversity in your society uh, so that you have the right teams behind you to help you take the next steps forward. Fantastic. Uh, Jonas, anything to add? Yeah, I think uh, one really important thing that uh, that we noticed in when we were doing sort of our uh, reviews was the visual representation of all members of the community. Because when sort of after the first year, when we were uh, looking to, you know, create new posters, new flyers and things like that, we realized that absolutely all of the photos that we have on campus um, from the esports arena were of just men. There were no women in, in any of our photos. And like it wasn't, and you know, obviously intentional or anything like that. Just uh, we noticed that none of our representations sort of had a diverse uh, and inclusive uh, group of people. So that's really tricky when you're trying to recruit new students. And if all they see is just, you know, uh, the same group of people in all of the photos, they might not be interested in joining your society. Okay, so next question, um, starting with you, Mercy, because I know you've got a great um, track record here. Um, how it's already been mentioned before, but how important is it to appoint a diverse committee uh, to manage a uh, club or society? I would say that it is very, very important. Um, I mean, for my society at least, um, having women on committee for the first time last year, we saw an unprecedented amount of women joining the society after that. And I think it comes back to what Jonas was just saying uh, about representation. If people see that somebody like them is on the committee, is already actively involved, then they feel a bit more comfortable joining and potentially they think that any concerns they may have, it might be easier to, to sort of air to a committee that would understand what their concerns might be about joining. Um, Jonas, any thoughts? Yeah, I think it, as I completely agree with what Mercy said. Um, for our the core society members, so sort of president, vice president, and treasurer, they're all elected. Um, and but we made steps to make sure that when so the elected three members elected uh, who are looking at the rest of the society and all the new roles that we introduced, like game admins, inclusivity admin, and things like that, we want to make sure that those roles are as diverse as as possible. And how is Warwick um, this year, Harry? How's that looking? Oh, you, you, you of course have a bad time for it. Like, um, we, <laughs> so I would say that for the last oh, three or four years, we've consistently had one or two women as part of our exec team. This year, coincidentally, we do have none. That's not bad. The women that do uh, that were exec, the ex execs, they still have a massive voice within our community. Um, I know that one of our ex execs is actually uh, Anissa, who is talking in the next panel. So there you go. There's a little work connection. But um, no, the women definitely do still have uh, a voice. Um, this year, like we did have women run for so for certain. It's just obviously it's a democratic election, so. It's down to the people's vote, but um, no, definitely uh, the women, the prominent women within our society, definitely still have a voice. Okay, I think it's quite important that um, um, a, a way is found. Um, you know, if you've got a democratic system and 
95% of the people voting for a role are male, the chances are um, that women are going to be disadvantaged, um, uh, just mean, mean, uh, mainly from unconscious bias that exists. So um, uh, there are a whole host of ways of, of getting around the um, lead on from unconscious bias that may exist from the historically that may exist within the society. So um, I'm not going to go through the through them now, but um, you know it's up to the committee. I mean Warwick, you know, for the whole of the next 12 months, not to have not to find a way to find you know create additional roles on the on the on the team that are tailor made for some of your leading women. You know that would be a shame. But um, uh, um, you know it's yeah. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll definitely, definitely try. Point. So yeah. Um, okay. So next question. Um, Codes of conduct have been mentioned already. Um, how can they be introduced so that they are taken seriously by new members? What's what's the techniques as far as having a code of conduct, getting it introduced to make sure they're taken seriously? Anyone? Uh, I'll go first. I'll say that uh, in in so to contrast your. A rule system so as a bit of a current stick you need to implement a clear punishment and retribution system as well uh, i think it, it's a vital section that you like you can't just uh set a, a load of rules uh, and like more well, guidelines about how people should behave but then the the outliers of the people that maybe don't want to uh conform to those guidelines they like they're not going to take it seriously because they have no idea what um uh consequences there are for uh, going anywhere past them. So uh, we, we've definitely, when we introduced our code of conduct, we definitely had the odd person that uh, wasn't taking it seriously. So we had to implement a punishment system very quickly. I think part of that is, is you have to like set up those sort of positive sort of expectations of we would like you to be like this first, but I feel like having that little addendum at the end, setting the boundary saying, but if there is a violation, then this will happen and then this will happen uh, and making it very clear what the consequences are of not following through. So I completely agree with that. Like the unfortunate, you've got to have the carrot and then also the punishment at the end. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, another thing that I'd say is, is obviously leading by, by example for the rest of the committees is incredibly important. And what we've noticed is because we have the esports arena and a lot of the, not a lot of some of the students, especially in intense moments uh, during competitive matches or, you know, ranked, ranked games and things like that, they might accidentally mention something and then, you know, approaching those students and actually not in, instantly punishing them, but having a proper conversation with them and saying like, do you like, why are you saying these things? Like, what's what's the reason? Do you understand what's the real meaning behind them and things like that? So having an open conversation, I feel, is, is incredibly important. Okay, so now I'm going to go to a question from our uh, audience. So a question from Joshua Spears. Um, As a society that's working from the ground upwards, what steps should we take to gain traction with our respective student union uh, to get the ball rolling with respect to how important university esports actually is? Uh, Jonas, you are, you are um, our um, representative from uh, uh, from management here. Um, um, how how should a uh, relatively new society be talking to um, uh, uh, various faculties to, to get them taken seriously? I guess it's 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 slightly tricky for me to say because we had sort of the very opposite. Uh, opposite problem to that because we had a massive support from faculty and from university when it comes to scholarships arena support of esports they knew what esports is and how incredible it can be it just didn't have the students on campus because uh, we we're a lot smaller smaller than universities like Warwick. but to answer the question i think a really important thing is showing and proving how useful esports is to developing terrible <coughs> skills and improving student uh, experience on campus. Not just saying like, yes, esports is great because we get to play games and make new friends, but actually sh actually saying like people will learn how to shoutcast, live stream, develop marketing skills, social media skills, and just using all of the, as I mentioned, like the, the word of the year is transferable skills. So just going through through that angle and how it can also help and improve student experience on campus in general. Anyone else got some 
a point to add? How, how are your relationships with um, your dean or, or head of department and your and your faculties? Do you, do you talk to them, or do they? Or, or uh, I guess if you're Harry, if you're looking to to get your own PCs, you must be. In yeah, we're, we're definitely like we we've got some connections to say the least. If anything, most of our connections is with um, uh, the IT department and technical support. For when, whenever we run lands and stuff, we have uh, very good relations with the technicians and people there, so that we can set up a uh, whenever whenever we have whenever we need to do in person. Obviously, it's not too prevalent uh, these days, but whenever we've had in person events of the past, we've always had good support from the university and also other societies. Uh, shout out to our computing society and, and anyone who's helped us there but um that kind of relationship to help us with especially all the um hardware and the infrastructure is uh definitely there similarly we found that having that connection with computer science students and therefore computer science faculty really helped us in getting access to the equipment and the rooms that we needed to make Esports more accessible for a lot of our members. That was that was our way in to the faculty, so to speak. Okay, I, I've just posted in the um, stage chat an article, um, some research from the US, where they were uh, studying um, how successful university um, esports societies were in in the US and what benefits they brought to the university as a whole, um, and and the, and the the benefits are very stark so in in two particular areas one if you have a, a thriving university esports society particularly if you've got a setup like um, jonas has um at roehampton um many more people apply to 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 join the university so numbers wanting to take any course at the university goes up substantially and the other thing is that uh, student satisfaction levels across the university also go up by several percentage points if you have a thriving esports society so for a relatively small investment um you know tens of thousands of pounds in in, in pcs and possibly a part-time coordinator in a similar role to to jonas um you've got hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of more fees and and more student income so it, it's a it's a financially um it's a no-brainer you know if you if you're watching this um uh, uh this broadcast now and you are the dean um of a university and i know there's at least one that um said they were going to uh, attend and you don't have um a a thriving esports or gaming society it's it financially it's a no-brainer uh, because students are happier more students will apply um, and it costs very little to invest in in PCs. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Um, next question. Uh, okay, it's a follow up to 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 what Joshua was just asking. So if you had the chance to speak to a dean uh, of a university or a faculty considering supporting student-led esports you know what would you tell them specifically about the benefits it brings to university life so it's just your experience rather than me quoting a research report you know what benefits does it bring to to university life do you think you know apart from um i guess some trophies potentially if you're if you're a successful team well i i would emphasize the fact that esports has the same kind of competitive and social scene and that kind of structure that uh, a regular sport would have and um, I'm sure every university has God knows how much funding and support for regular sports uh, stadiums and courts and God knows what so but not only that esports has the added advantage of naturally having a better social infrastructure so uh, it's got those ed added advantages to, on top of those regular sports as well as such a close affiliation with communication and social media so it's it's such a boom it's well not only that it's it's, it's booming it's it's a it's such a growing part of the new era so if anything you can say it's better to help sooner rather than later because you can make the bigger impact and also maybe as a cheap shot say that especially in current times it's an, it's an inherently safe and uh socially acceptable um uh, sport right now if you could say um so it's definitely definitely checks every health and safety quota mercy any thoughts 
Uh, I mean, we, again, in our talks with faculty have been emphasizing the sort of skills that you can get out of it uh, in terms of, because ours is purely student led, uh, having students manage teams, having students working on those communication skills and picking out different people who have different strengths and working together to make something successful in a sort of social transferable skills, again, sort of sense. Okay, so, sorry, go on, Janice. Yeah, sorry, i just like to echo what, what Harry said as well, is, is the, the social aspect of it is, is incredibly important, especially because I know a lot of universities have an uh, increasing number of off-campus students living, you know, away from, from university. And let's see, if you live off-campus and it takes you an hour and a half to get to university, there's a very little chance that you will be uh, attending, you know, rugby practice, football practice and things like that. Because if you get home at, at midnight, that's, you know, that's not, that's not great. But with esports, you can still have that competitive feeling uh, with the university and the pride of representing your own university, your own uh, esports society even while playing from home, even though we have the esports arena and we tell all of our students, like if you have a setup at home, especially now in, in, in COVID days, it's just uh, go ahead and, and, and play, play from home. That's one of the main things that we initially were uh, presenting to our VC and to the rest of the, the staff on campus. Uh, I just think, um, yeah, the, the fact that this kind of event can can share best practice that is going on in different universities all around the country um, uh, it, it, it is is excellent and the way forward but you know I guess um, students and student society shouldn't be shy about you know what um, uh, they are achieving sometimes in quite difficult circumstances so some of the conversations I've had with the struggle just to get a, 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 a gaming society off off the ground with with with, with no PCs um, and no support is, is is frightening. But you know, if you can find the right people and tell them that on a on a Saturday afternoon there are infinitely more people playing uh, video games than there are playing traditional sports, um, you know, they you know people need to wake up to the fact. Um, if you, as I said earlier, if your university um, has um, uh, strong sports scholarship scheme. Why aren't, why are they not offering um, esports scholarships? Um, uh, you know, what, why are, are traditional sports um, being um, having preferential uh, treatment when um, the kids, everybody, you know, want um, want to see more um, uh, gaming and 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 competitive uh, gaming? Okay, so. Uh, next question, um, do you have examples of sessions or events that are going to encourage new diverse members, so events for newbies and, and uh, to encourage a, you know, a more wider um, participation rather than hardcore um, traditional esports, if I can put it like that. Uh, anyone? We found that for our freshers this year, especially having um, streamed esports, so members who were here last year just playing casually together, um, and having our freshers be able to join the chat and comment on it and just experience it as a viewer first, potentially, um, was a really good inroad to get them interested and realize that it's not all as hardcore as it's necessarily pointed out to be. Yeah, I definitely think the name esports can be a little bit intimidating. I know even one of the people I live with, uh, she um, plays games casually, and she said she didn't initially. She didn't want to be a part of the esports society because she thought, "Oh, I'm not good enough." And I think I'm not good enough. It's such a uh, it's such a sad thing to hear, especially as someone um, from an esports society. Like, um, just so you want to do something that includes all freshers so we've been doing our obligatory freshers events um last couple of weeks and one of them was big pub quiz online pub quiz we just did kahoot shout out to kahoot um uh and another thing we're going to be uh, introducing soon is a sort of live coaching session so or like lessons so something that uh, where some of our most experienced players and coaches can stream or make a video or do a, a discord uh call and then uh, do and talk about 
uh, how they play the game, how people can improve and things like that. And I think especially people who join an esports society to improve will definitely find that very, very appealing. Yeah, for for us, we are clo fo closely following the sport department. As, as you mentioned before, David, all of the esports scholarship are classified as sports scholarships as well. And all the students get things like access to the gym. And we try to follow um, all of their plans uh, as close as we can. Uh, the sport department has a weekly woman only workout session where, you know, specifically workout specifically uh, for women only. So we're looking to introduce something similar to esports because we have this space and we're looking to do sort of coffee mornings at, at Rohampton esports where uh, we'll reserve the space specifically for all women on campus to meet in one place and get to get uh, get together, get to know each other and, um, you know, play games uh, that way. Okay, so I've got. I'm going to fit in another question from the audience from uh, Stephen Macero. Are university teams allowed to generate their own profit? Question mark to reinvest in new tech kit and finance the team's development, uh, such as American football. Wouldn't that be um, a, an easier bullet for the dean treasurer to swallow? Uh, we, one of our uh, sources of income is uh, merchandise. I'm definitely not going to uh, go and plug our own merchandise. That'd be a little bit unethical. But um, uh, we um, definitely uh, we have a lot. Of, we have our affiliation with the website, and we get approached by um, commercial website. I think uh, Raven is a good example. They're one of the NSE people, uh, and Gamers Apparel is another good example. But um, people, so these kind of companies that offer to sell uh, t uh, like jerseys and shirts and uh, obviously like, I don't know, masks these days and backpacks and God knows what that has your symbol on it. Um, pe people who have that pride, is def that's definitely a nice little extra source of income that you can use to reinvest and put into that treasury pool. Yeah, there is a, a marketplace out there. Um, um, but, um, you know, I think the big, the big players, if you can get on board the PC manufacturers, um, uh, that the, that's when you are, um, uh, going to hit um, uh, pay dirt. So I've got one final question before we go to um, our next panel, and uh, it's a linking question. So uh, the Newell has a very exciting upcoming uh, uh, women's and non-binary uh, tournament uh, for League of Legends. This is a first for UK universities. What do you think of this, and are you putting in a team? I personally think it's a brilliant idea. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna gonna start with that. Um, I don't think we've got a full team yet, but if we can get one, we will definitely be putting forward a team. Uh, it's I think it's a great opportunity to encourage that sort of public engagement. Uh, with esports for women and that is something that women can get, do get involved with. Absolutely. I, I, I agree. It's it's a brilliant idea. And if, if this was hosted last year, I, prob I think we probably would have almost two teams. But this year, a lot of uh, our uh, women League of Legends players graduated, uh, you know, the choice of building teams at, at universities. Um, so if we can build a team, we'll 100% uh, send one. And I, I absolutely love the initiative. Yeah, it, it, it will be so exciting to see how the tournament evolves. Uh, and, it's, and it's just uh, one of, one of uh, all the events that are cropping up all over the place now. And it's so promising that uh, people, like organizations like the Newell are being one of the pioneers in this kind of thing. So we, uh, it's going to be the first of many, I'm sure. Uh, but we've, we've uh, within our society, we've put out our feelers. See, see uh, we're trying to garner as much interest as possible. And hopefully we'll be able to gather a team in the coming weeks. Okay, thanks very much, um, panel. That's all we have got uh, time for. Um, I, I thought that was amazingly interesting. So maybe we can um, bring in our panel uh, from um, uh, the mainly from the Newell, um, Abby and uh, Tasha and Anissa with um, uh, Angela. Uh, good evening, ladies. Um, uh, I am not going to stay around any longer. I'm going to hand over to Tatcha, who is going to chair this panel. Uh, we're all looking forward to it. Um, 
uh, fantastically. So, uh, so have a good session. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our panel about practical methods of increasing inclusion in campus gaming and esports communities. Um, so I guess we'll start with uh, introducing ourselves. So I'm Tasha. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she, her. I used to go to the University of Manchester and now I'm creative director at the Newell. Anissa, do you want to go next? Uh, hi, I'm Anissa or Geomancy. I am the League of Legends product manager at the Newell, but I'll also be running the women's tournament that David has just mentioned. I'm also a third year at Warwick studying French and German, and I was the previous media secretary for Warwick Esports. Cool. Abby? Hello, I'm Abby Sheha. Um, I'm a Loughborough graduate. Um, I chaired our Video Game Society for two years. I've now gone on to work for the Newell as one of the community team, and I also work for Loughborough Students' Union. I'm in my second year as one of their sabbaticals. And Angela? Hi, um, I'm Angela. Um, I'm non-binary and I use both he, her and she, him. She, her and he, him pronouns. <laughs> um, I was formerly president of the Newcastle University Video Gaming and Esports Society. Um, I graduated last month, so I'm currently unemployed, unfortunately. Cool. So I guess we'll, we'll kick off to begin with. Um, where do you start? when you want to develop a, a diverse and inclusive and kind of welcoming community on, on campus? So I, I think, think go, 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 go. So I think <laughs> the main place to start, um, especially if you're a mostly male dominated society and your committee is mostly made up of men, is to understand that you won't always understand what the problems are and to listen to what minority groups tell you are the problems. So, when I first went to Newcastle, the entire committee was full of men and I'd try and explain to them why like things weren't particularly welcoming. And they just like asked me to explain in a lot of detail, like why things weren't okay. And I, it's just, it was quite a lot of mental effort to go to um, and a lot of pressure to put on me as well to try and explain um, why things that are really obvious to me are problems, you know? So I think it's important to listen to what people are telling you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a similar experience at Loughborough. Um, we're quite a male dominated university, um, about 70%. Um, and obviously like esports is often dominated um, by men as well. So when I first went onto committee, it was chairman um, and a lot of language that, you know, wasn't very inclusive. Mm. So it, it can be small changes that start the ball, uh, the ball rolling um, that can help make um, people feel more welcome. Um, simple language changes um, can mix up the status quo, which is never easy um, to change immediately. It is um, small steps and easy wins that can get you there. Um, I think it's also important to add that having change is nice, but you also need to, you know, start the change from the uh, top. So like having a committee preaching, um, you know, uh, inclusivity and diversity within their society and then also believing in those uh, sort of things and not going behind sort of like society's back and then in their own group chats be really like discriminatory, discriminatory and uh, harass people. It's best to, you know, start from the top and then work your way down. So yeah, don't to, mm -hmm. to pre preach what you believe and also um, not go against what you're preaching as well. Yeah, you got to lead it by example, right? <laughs> if you're on committee, you're there because you're representing the views of your entire society. Um, so if you're only representing um, one group, you're actively discouraging like another group um, through like your own acts. So yeah, it has to come from the top. Um, and it's not easy if you're the only voice as well that's um, backing you up. Um, and we'll chat a little bit later about how you can get some support um, if you are the only person um, who's trying to make change. Yeah, for sure. So what about if you were in a situation where um, you're not 
like the change maker in your in your society or you're just a member of the society and you can recognize that there's these problems happening um and you don't know how to make those changes because you're not for example um like the president or the secretary what sort of options do you have to make change yeah i think it, it depends on your own personal barriers when you're in that position um it may be that um, the change maker, so the chair or the president, is quite receptive to hearing your views. Or it could be, um, like Angela said, um, that you're often having to do all the emotional weight um, yourself and explaining where you're coming from. And that can get very quickly tiring um, and it might wear you down to where you just give up. Um, it's quite important to find support um, instead of it just being your voice, having someone else on the committee or even um, if members have also voiced complaints, they can be another voice to back you up so that you have an ally in what you're saying. Um, if you don't have that internally, then you can look externally to your students' union for help, um, whether it be getting you training. It could be that if the, the chair or the president is like particularly problematic, that you can get help um, either getting them training um, or it may be even that you remove the president um, if it's really that problematic. I'd say for the most part, it's not, it doesn't get that bad, right? Um, but yeah, definitely turn to your SU if no one else can help you. I think it's also important to add that no idea is stupid. So like if you have an idea and you feel like it'd be good for the society, especially in terms of uh, increasing inclusivity, j just put it forward and see what people say, uh, say in your committee and if you don't get much support, as Abby has said, just go to USU, go to other people and you'll you'll find support, especially if it is a good idea. I've found in the past that students unions do take these sorts of issues very seriously. So if um, you find that the committee are particularly problematic or not listening to you, I find that the students union will tend to back you up and take the problem very seriously, or they should anyway. And if they don't, then that's a serious problem with the students union. Um, thankfully, Newcastle's was lo is lovely, so. Yeah, we had a pretty good student union at Manchester as well. Um, so I guess we've established that if things are difficult within a society, the student union is an option um, that you can go to. Um, but I suppose that a lot of members of a society or a committee don't really know who in the student union they can talk to when things are going wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so if one of you could expand on that a little bit. Um, at Loughborough at least, um, and I, I think it's actually a legal requirement across the country that a student union does have um, someone responsible on their sabbatical team. So that is the, the student representative team. So they've been elected as students um, to take on responsibility to look over solely welfare and diversity at your um, university. It might be that they're their own position, so you might have uh, a welfare and diversity officer. It might be that it's the role of, say, the president um, or the vice president to do that. So they can often be your first point of call. Um, but yeah. Um, Angela, do you want to talk about societies exec? Because um, I know you are oh, part of yeah. yeah. For um, a short period of time, I think when I was the, my first year I was president, I worked on the society's executive committee, which is made up of executives from a variety of different societies. And they sort of make decisions in terms of what money to give out and what punishments to give societies as well. And the, um, a lot of issues tend to get discussed there. And um, they're usually headed by the activities officer. So like if you have a problem... Um, and you contact the activities officer, often you'll get invited down to the executive committee, you'll explain what the problem is, and they'll discuss amongst themselves what, what can be done to help you, give you resources, or maybe would they take sort of responsibility themselves and say, okay, we're going to talk to the society and say X, Y, or Z, or punish them in whatever way, because clearly what they're doing is unacceptable, etc. This so the, there's a lot of there's a lot of different people you can talk to. I think there's most SUs. Yeah, have a dedicated welfare officer. There's a, there's usually dedicated activities officers. There's a whole panel of students um, who are dedicated to helping people with these kinds of problems. So. Yeah, a lot of the time as well, your activities or your society's officer um, will provide you with some kind of foundation for making your own 
either moderation tools or like a code of conduct. Um, so that can be a really solid foundation to help make a small change in your society. So if you have a Discord and you have very clearly rules on display where you know you're saying that harassment isn't acceptable and that you're accepting everyone, um, just having that publicly on display can help reassure people that it's a safe space for them. Um, and you don't need to write that yourself, um, whether it's the any key document that was mentioned before um, or guidance from um, women in games um, or even your students union, you should be able to get some help in writing um, a good solid code of conduct to keep everyone feeling safe and happy. I know when we were writing our um, rules for Discord for Newcastle, we basically looked at the code of conduct that the students union has and basically copied the main points from that. So stuff about um, discrimination being unacceptable, we basically just pulled that straight out. And we'd often use that as sort of like, um, we'd explain that, you know, these are the students union's rules, you know, um, we, we want, we must follow them. It's, it's like, obviously as executives, these are important rules and we want to enforce them, but also like the SU, like enforces these rules as well. It's extremely important if you have someone who's particularly rowdy in the society, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've got to realise that if they're actively being derogatory, um, that can impact their university life, right? Like they can get reprimanded, they could get suspended. Um, so if you do have particularly problematic people who are kind of fighting you on being more inclusive or don't quite get it, um, I know in some of the communities I've been a part of, there's that kind of expectation to be edgy as a gamer, and that can often be quite problematic that they have to realize that they're at university level now. So you're expected to conduct yourself in a manner that represents your university, but also yourself in a good light. Um, so if you ever get a stick for your moderation rulings, they gotta know that, you know, if they step out of line, the university could take action as well. It's not just a discord bot telling them off. Um, it could have real life implication, uh, implications as well. Yeah, definitely. Especially with a lot of the societies um, posting their Discord links on socials, for example, and having them linked on Twitter, um, it's pretty easy for a for a university or an SU to just join a Discord channel of a society mm -hmm. and then find all of the chaotic things that are going on in that Discord. Yeah. Um, As a SU officer, I definitely creep in uh, <laughs> some of my society <laughs> Discords to have a look at what they're doing, and if I see something like a not safe for work channel or something that's not okay, you know, drop them a PM and be like, mm, maybe we we'll get you some training on that. But yeah. Yeah. So I guess what kind of training is usually available from a student union about things like that? Um, it depends on the SU, um, honestly. Um, from facilitating some training through the new, um, we found that there was quite a large gap between what some societies get given and what some um, like kind of good SUs are providing. So it can be a mixed bag, but I would hope that at your university there is a push for EDI training, um, which is, um, I'm going to forget the E word <laughs> already, diversity, inclusion, and can anyone help because my brain is shot today? Equality? Maybe? Equality, thank you, yes. <laughs> I had no idea. And inclusion training. Uh, so that would be the word that's thrown around, which is not particularly student friendly, um, but they will have someone responsible for welfare at the SU so you would hope that they've been trained so therefore they can train you um, and if you've not heard about any of your training make sure to reach out to like your activities tab um, you might have a society sabbatical who can pin, uh, signpost you to where that is um, some SUs do really good comprehensive um, training workshops obviously with um, COVID um, that might be online now but it should still be accessible um, and for you to yeah get the skills that you need um, to get the ball rolling in your society. Okay, cool. Um, I guess, Anissa or Angela, uh, is there any training that your student union offered to your societies? So um, there is, I know our university requires that um, every society apply, has a welfare officer who deals with these kinds of things, who deals with these, um, problems of welfare and diversity and therefore they're required to attend a meeting at the start of every year um, and an, an obligatory training session though unfortunately I haven't heard very positive things about it I hear it's very sort of 
very basic sort of don't be racist sort of speeches rather than genuine or like more in-depth strategies on how to deal with problematic behavior um but i believe if you have specific issues that you need taking on if you contact your su and, and ask them the correct questions directly or ask to meet with your activities officer or your welfare officer in person they'll be able to work through your individual issues more closely our um su requires the same i think i think we have to have a welfare officer in every society um and they do do training for the welfare officer as well i've not been to it um but I, I mean, I haven't heard anything bad about it, so mm -hmm. I'm assuming it, it, it is a good training from the SU. Yeah, a left um it's not mandatory. Um, it's something that my committee um, have pointed that they think it should be. We do offer kind of mediation tools. So the way that we train our societies is that you're there to be a, a volunteer and do all the fun stuff that comes with being a volunteer. But a lot of the fun stuff also comes with the bad side of dealing with conflict management, mediation and tools like that. And that's where we will step in. So if you have a problematic member who has like kicked off in Discord, maybe they're harassing someone, then it would be my job to mediate getting a resolution for you so that you don't have to have that difficult conversation yourself because it gets very taxing very quickly when you're dealing with someone who's just being problematic for no reason. Um, and a lot of the time it's easier for me to kind of like put my bad cop uh, hat on I kind of wade in and tell them what happens if they continue. Um, so you, you don't have to deal with it on your own at all. Um, and I wouldn't want any committee member to be dealing with like a problematic student on their own either, because it's not fair. I know when I was dealing with particularly problematic people, I got the best responses when I just said what the consequences were rather than trying to appeal to their emotional side. So basically saying, look, the society will get deratified if we allow this behaviour. If you don't stop, we're, we're going to ban you. Like, there's no two ways about it. Or, um, or we'd get a bot who would just automatically remove content so, to deflect the blame away from individual executives because they can't blame any one person for deleting a comment and be like, oh, why did you leave my con content? Are you, like, sensitive? Are you, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, oh, you know, the robot did it. Don't set the robot, you know? <laughs> um <laughs> It doesn't have to all be doom and gloom, right? Like the, there's the the moderation side, but there's also the the fun side of being more accessible um, and inclusive in general. Like reaching out and doing collaboration events um, can be really beneficial to um, engage students that you wouldn't otherwise, and that can be a really good opportunity to kind of like open your members' eyes to what else there is um, on campus. So we we did simple events like we went and watched. Um, was it Wonder Woman? This was, this was a while ago, but we went to watch Wonder Woman with the Women's Network, who were a liberation group on campus. And that was really great because we sat down and we had Nando's together afterwards and you got to ask them questions about what it is that they do. They asked questions about what we do as a video game society because we have no idea. We're completely different groups, right? Um, and it was really lovely to have that connection. Um, and likewise, if you have any like big campaigns on campus, that can be a fun thing to get involved with that can foster inclusion. So going on a women's march, getting involved with Black History Month, um, those sort of national campaigns, um, your SU will be pushing them anyway, so you might as well get involved. And a lot of the time the work's been done for you. Um, your student unions already designed all the events for uh, Black History Month, so all you need to do is kind of put your hand up and go, how can we help or how can we get involved? Um, and that's the fun side, right? Like you're reaching out and you're actively doing more to show that you know you want to engage new students. Yeah, we did a lot of events like that at Newcastle as well whilst I was president because um, we have, a, well, we even nowadays, Newcastle, well, at Newcastle we have a problem that when p new students come along, they look at the gaming society and their immediate thought is, oh, it's going to be a boys club, it's going to be really intimidating, I'm, not inter I'm interested in video games but I'm not even, there's no point. Um, so what we often try, try to do is we would do these collaborative events with other societies like Feminism Society or It Happens Here Newcastle Deal, who is a basically a sexual assault assistant helpline for the, as a society. And we do collaborative events with them. I think we've done like um, gaming nights exclusively for women and gender minorities. Um, we've um, had like corners where we set up video games for people to calm down during like conferences which were about particularly heavy subjects that sort of thing 
And those were always very popular because people, by collaborating with these societies from a very cynical point of view, people knew that we cared about these issues and they'd give us another look and give us a chance. But also like it demonstrates to your members that you, you know, that you actively care about these issues. And all these events always end up being a load of fun and you'll end up engaging with new people you wouldn't have otherwise met. I, I, I always had a lot of fun doing those events, so. Yeah, that's cool. We used to do similar things at University of Manchester. Um, when we ran King of the North, we would have like booths and we'd invite loads of other societies from the university to come and just like set up a booth and do whatever random things their society do. Um, and then we'd all we'd all go out for food after and, and just find out more about what their society does. Um, it's a really good opportunity to meet more people and kind of broaden your horizons as well. So at these events and in Discord servers, for example, how do you make that a welcoming place? What sort of methods do you use um, to make those places feel more welcoming to new people or to people from, from different backgrounds? Um, a technique that our society has picked up from the new committee and it was prevalent within our society's Rocket League Discord, is having a um, point of contact as soon as you join. So we don't actually have a bot that welcomes people. We have uh, actual members of the committee or helpers um, jo uh, like welcoming you and asking you what role you'd want. And I think that's quite nice because it, it's, it can be quite intimidating to join a Discord full of like uh, hundreds of people and then, you know, uh, see chats going on but not knowing how to include yourself into the chat. But if you've already had someone you've spoken to and if they've, I, I guess, because they are on the committee and they've had, they have some sort of authority over the uh, society itself, it's, it, it just gives you the confidence to, um, you know, getting like involved in the conversation and joining games and things like that so i think that was uh, quite a good idea done from our um rocket league side of our society and we've and the new committee have adapted it to do it across all servers so i think you know having human contact as soon as you as soon as you've joined a discord server or the society is really good I think it's important. Um, it's something that the last panel mentioned actually is that the word esports can, to some people, think the immediate thing that they think is it's too competitive for me. That's not where I want to be. So it's it's really important to think about the events that you're facilitating and think about different areas of um, gaming, but also like the social aspect as well of joining a society. Um, you don't join a society just for the key thing that's in their name, right? You join it to find friends and a community. So how are you fostering that community? Um, so yeah, human contact straight away is a really, really good example of straight away that person knows who they can get in touch with again. Um, and they've had introduction and they know something about each other, but then inviting them to an event where they feel comfortable. So not everyone wants to come to like a League of Legends trials straight away because they might be worried that their like ranks too low. Um, they might be worried that they'll get judged. But maybe if you do like a quiz night or an Animal Crossing evening or think about games that don't have a competitive nature to them, like um, I guess you can be competitive in Scribble.io, but that kind of game where it's less serious um, can really help make people feel at ease so that then when you are running your trials and your more competitive events, they already have like a foot in the door almost um, and don't feel like scared off in any way. Yeah, um, definitely. I really enjoy um I really enjoy attending viewing parties as well because that doesn't involve like actually demonstrating your skill in the game, which is often quite intimidating. Um, because I think there is a big problem of sort of gatekeeping in general. Actually, I remember when I attended my first viewing party at Newcastle, I was really scared that people would start questioning my knowledge of the game. If I like, do, do I even know which players on which team? Do I know what position they play? Um when I really just wanted to, you know, sit and see what happened and, you know, learn new things. Um, and I think, you know, it's important to be conscious of that, that people might be intimidated if you sort of question them too much or, um, 
or if you generally gatekeep people who are less skilled or have less knowledge in the game because like people could be like getting into the game and want to learn more but like mm -hmm. everyone has to start out somewhere so it's important to be conscious of the things that you're asking people straight away especially people who you're not familiar with or are new to the university experience yeah i hated being asked immediately after saying i play dota what rank are you um because i don't like play ranked i play because it's a fun game and i enjoy like the teamwork and all of that aspect like if you'd ask me like what's my favorite hero or what position do i play um it's a it's a much more like open-ended question that you can have a back and forth with if you ask what's your rank and they go oh i'm bronze like your reaction is probably going to be to judge that person and they instantly will not feel welcome um you want to build their confidence up so that they feel a part of the community before you can kind of have that back and forth where you know like my mates will make fun of me because of my rank but that's because i've known them for um a really long time if i walk into a room filled with people i've never met before and instantly go oh bronze scrub go talk to them like i no, I'm not coming back, right? Like, you got to ask me a question that can build me up into a conversation so that, um, like we said before, like having the human connection with someone is really important. I think it's very, like, I think you brought up a good point, sort of, there's this idea of um, parasocial relationships where, like, you will act more familiar with someone than you actually are. And like you'll go straight in a way with like the jerks or the it like especially if you've been around in the society for a long time, like you're a second or a third year, and you've got in jerks, you've got sort of these ironic jerks. Uh, like with me and my friends, we'll often like call each other fake gamer girls as a joke because we're good friends. We've known each other for many years. But if I was a a new student and a third year came up to me as like during my first time there, and a joke said, "Oh, you're a fake gamer girl," haha, I'd be like. Uh, I'm a bit, <laughs> that, that's a bit too familiar. I can't tell if this is ironic or not. It makes me feel very self-conscious. Um, I think it's important to be aware of like not being too heavy with the cliques and the in-jokes and the ironic humour and to be conscious of the language you use with new students to make sure they feel welcome and that they're not like outside of the circle, this, like the inner circle of committee members or whatever. Yeah, I, I hated, um, as the chair, everyone knew my name, um, and they come up and be like, oh, Abby, I saw you doing this, like, oh, I watched the stream that you're doing, um, and there's that familiarity, but then I never, like, I don't know their name, I've met them before, right, and I remember, like, in what setting, but they would automatically assume that we were, like, best of friends, because they followed me in a committee sense, um, and I hate the word banter, that's one thing that, like, automatically puts me off of a person if they feel like they can have like informal banter with me when I'm not familiar with them um and it, it is it's an easy thing to fall into um this kind of like parasocial relationship of like assuming you know a person um it's much better just to play it safe and just be a nice human being in general you know like be kind make sure that you welcome people um and keep up the practices that you have during the welcome period as well um talking about uh, cliques forming if kind of like by December, your society is kind of like plateaued, your membership steady, you might still get new people joining. And if you don't have that kind of like welcome hat on where you're like, hey, what's your name? What course are you on? Uh, what role do you play? Then they can't, they don't have an in, they don't have that foot in the door again um, and they're being excluded in that chance. So it, it's really important for committee to keep the welcome hat on and keep an open mind to ensuring that everyone that's coming it'll be a discord event because of covid but if someone joins the channel and you don't recognize their username you've got to be switched on to welcome them in that sense yeah i think a lot of a lot of inclusivity talk comes down to language and the way that you talk with each other and the way that you talk to new people um in discord communities um and that's where things that we mentioned, like the community guidelines and the code of conduct really help because they help mm -hmm. manage the, that language that's going on in these communities. Um, so I, I'm i sure we could all keep talking all night about things like this, but we, um, we've we actually run out of time. So it's uh, we've had our half an hour, but we will uh, be heading over to the Women in Games Discord now um, to facilitate any questions or any back and forth or, or networking. So if anyone wants to join us, we'll be over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.
I thought there were some really great uh, discussions uh, throughout the the in, entire conference, um, and I've written a lot of notes. Um, which I hope to, to follow up on. I, I think that Ryan Smith, Nicola Jill, Stephen McCaro all made some interesting points um, to, and, and to me as well. Um, and, and I think one of the things that I wanted to say is that when any industry, culture or sports evolve, there are naturally polarised positions because it's tribal and people want to be labelled, but they don't want to be labelled. Um, whether it's by gender or for any other reason, but, but equally they don't want to be excluded and harassed because of their gender or any other reason. Um, women in games is forging forward in a very particular direction to support the community as a whole and to really consider the best approach. Um, it's never going to be everything to everyone. So I think one of my feelings is that whether you're a, an organizer, whether you're a university, whoever you are, you make a decision about what you want to do and how you want to do it. And I think the partnership with the CAT Collective has been very interesting for me uh, in terms of thinking about or seeing uh, a, a, a group of people deciding that they want a certain thing and they want it to be a certain way. And then they draw in people who want, who want it to be like that. Um, and, I, and I think there's something in that. So... I'm learning fast and I hope that as a community we can evolve to make esports, uh, you know, it already is an amazing industry, but uh, a more amazing industry uh, and, a, and a, uh, you know, a, a positive space for everyone to be in. Um, okay, well, that's a wrap from me. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the event. I've learned so much. Um, and I'd just like to remind you to join the Women in Games Discord server to carry on speaking to each other and networking with the speakers. Um, we look forward to the opportunity of connecting to you all again soon. And I'd like to thank everybody who engaged in the conference, spoke at the conference and attended the conference. Wish you a good night, a good day or a good morning. You are. Um, so bye for now.